Okay. Um, so the idea, uh, welcome to the virtual tutorial. The idea of this one is just to give a brief introduction to uh, power programming models. And this is a amalgamation of slides through from a few different talks that I've given in the past. And I have, I think, slightly too many slides for the time I'm supposed to talk. But we'll start going through and see how we get on. Um, if you want to ask any questions, please just use the, the chat for the moment. Or you can uh, unmute your mic and talk. And hopefully, we should hear if um, you're asking something. So I'll just take through the first slide. There's a slide about um, reusing this material and sharing it. And there's also this slide that tells you who the uh, partners are in um, the Archer Supercomputing Service, so it's supported by EPSRC and NERC from the Research Councils. Craig provide the hardware, EPCC provide a lot of the effort, and the University of Edinburgh provide the hosting. Um, so I wanted to give you a quick outline of what the actual drivers for power programming are. Why, why do we do power programming? Right? Because it's actually much harder than um, serial programming. So there's got to be a reason for it. And traditionally, the, the driver of power programming was that a single processor couldn't provide you the time solution required for your complex simulations. Okay? So it just took too long to do the simulation. To get the results you wanted just took too long. So the only way people could do this was to um, tie multiple cores together into an HPC machine. But before that, there were things like uh, vector, pro or before that, there were things like vector processors and these sort of things, which were parallel in a slightly different way. But really, this is where high performance computing came from. And this sort of explains why um, HPC and parallel programming are also uh, so synonymous in some senses. And really, and recently, actually, due to the physical limit and increase the power of single cores, the drivers now become the fact that all modern processors are parallel, right? The processor that you have in your laptop, in your, um, in your PC, your desktop, wherever they are, tend to be parallel. Like they're all multi-core machines now. You don't get very many uh, single core, core machines. So power programming is really required for all computing now, not just HPC. So I think from uh, my viewpoint, that makes the power programming a useful thing to learn. Um, even if you don't see your career carrying on in uh, HPC and academic research, power programming and the concepts behind it are still useful concepts in uh, the wider world now, but maybe in a way that they weren't so much um, until a few years ago. So in terms of HPC, uh, the drive has always been the same in HPC. You want some really complex simulations with reasonable time to solution. Um, for most people, that isn't often the quickest time to solution, but it's just reasonable enough. So you want to be able to put your simulation in and come back uh, within a reasonable time and get the results. It doesn't ha often doesn't have to be within 10 minutes, but within um, three months is often too long. But it depends on the simulation. There are some people who are multi-month uh, month, month simulations, and it depends on your use case. So the single core, even the multiple processors in the current workstation, often don't provide the compute or memory or the I/O performance that uh, required. Um, to be able to do this. So hence the need for HPC. And the solution we take is to harness the power of multiple cores simultaneously. This is the parallel nature of parallel program. And to do this, we require the concept that allows to exploit the resources in this parallel manner. And this is where parallel programming comes from. And there are a number of different parallel programming models over time. And this um, virtual tutorial is just to provide a quick, or oh, a very high level overview of the most popular parallel program, the two most popular parallel programming models. Um, they're in use at the moment, namely shared memory and message passing programming. But to be able to understand um, the differences between these two parallel programming models, you need to know a bit about the sort of underlying way in which the operating system um, handles or handles allocation of resources on the hardware. And I've titled this as processes and threads. So what does the operating system actually do? I mean, most people are familiar with an operating system of some sort, be it Linux on uh, HPC machines and some desktops for people, or more commonly Windows and um, OS X for Mac users on um, laptops and things like that. All the um, OS does is due to day-to-day -day management of tasks um, between what you want to do and the underlying hardware. So for example, which cores is a particular application running on? How is the memory allocated and deallocated? How do you 
um, provide the right memory resources and then free them up for the next program that might be running. How is the file system accessed and who has uh, permission to do what and which resources? And how do we deal with oversubscription, more applications running than calls available? Because typically on your laptop in particular, this is almost always the case. Right? So if you have a um, quad core laptop, it's got four cores, you very often have more than four applications running at any one time. And the, uh, the operating system has to know how to uh, balance those things. So these running applications are controlled through the concept of processes and threads. And I'm going to quickly just go through what they are. Um, but if you have any questions on these, you can ask or ask at the end. So a process, each application really, you can think of as a separate process within the operating system. So for example, if I'm running um, a web browser and um, a, a word processor such as Word, they're two separate applications and tend to, be, tend to correspond to two separate processes on your computer. Each process has its own memory space which can't be accessed by any other running process. And this is very important for security reasons. If you're running a web browser and so a website compromises it, you don't want them to be able to get into the other processes running, such as your um, Word document and steal the confidential information that you're typing up or something like that. So this, is very, this um, separation of memory is very important for that. And also, it's very important to allow the stability of applications, because if other people could write over your memory, then you just crash. Your application would generally just crash all the time. So each process is scheduled to run by the OS. It can be tied to a particular core or migrated between cores. Generally on HPC, we tie it to a particular core because that way you get the best performance because there's a cost associated with migrating a process um, between cores. Okay, so that's processes. And the pro processes have to be scheduled by the OS. So the OS is responsibility for interrupting processes and granting the core to another process. And this is the term what's called the scheduling process. And it, the interrupt happens every so often, usually on the order of much less than a second. And then every at that time interval, the OS will check what needs to be run, what's running, what's stored, and the process selected has to have processing work to do, right? So if you're stored waiting for access to memory or something off disk, quite often you'll get shuttled off and something that really has some work to do will get shuffled in. Um, rather confusingly, hardware can support scheduling of multiple processes um, to a single core very quickly, known as, through a process known as symmetric multi-threading. And the confusing nature is here that threading here is not the same as um, software threads. So these are hardware threads, or something very different. And um, what this usually appears the operating system has is an additional core for use. So very often when you have particularly, say, um, a machine that has Intel processors, such as Archer, um, if you actually go and look at how many cores the operating system thinks it has, it's doubled the number of physical cores because there are two hardware threads allowed per core. On Archer, on the compute node, certainly the default is that you, you don't have access to this extra hardware thread. You have to specifically ask for it to be able to use it because generally it's suboptimal um, to use these extra threads generally. But some, pro some applications, particular applications can take advantage of it. So it's worth experimenting with at least once uh, if you've got a new application running up on Archer to see if it adds anything. Moving on from processes to threads, um, most applications we think of as having a single thread. Right? I, word, I have a single process that's running through. It has its own one thread associated with it, and it does everything sequentially. But with the advent of multi-core processes, it's becoming more common for a process to contain multiple threads. So each process can have multiple threads within it doing um, simultaneous tasks that have access to the um, same bit of memory. So they can act on um, the memory in a parallel way. And one way you often see this used, and I always use the example of a web browser, is that you might have um, a page that has a video embedded in it. And rather than um, a single thread having to deal with loading the video and um, running and serving the content in the web page, what your browser will tend to do nowadays is spawn a separate thread um, to run the video. So you have two threads running at once with access to the same memory space. One will be sorting out the web page and the images on it and the text and things like that, and the other thread will be um, running the video. And this um, actually corresponds to improved performance, right, because your video runs smoothly, isn't choppy, and things like that. Um, on HPC, the driver for using threads is much the same. You can get more efficient usage of the resources. So the picture here shows a, a single thread process coming along and then it does 
performs an operation called a fork and splits into two threads, uh, which process simultaneously, and at some point they join back together again. So when you have lots of processes running in parallel, they tend to be separate and um, have their lifetime. The same is true of threads. They tend to have a certain lifetime um, with this fork join. And what you actually find with threads is that this fork joining tends to happen a lot through the lifetime of the process. Um, as I've said, all threads in the process have access to the same memory. Um, and the threads can offer asynchronously. So this is often used in um, graphic, graphical user interfaces. If you're waiting for a button press or something else going on in the background, so you have a thread monitoring the button presses. And when you press something, it'll launch a thread that does something else in the background. Um, the OS is usually aware of threads and can schedule them properly. But they're usually scheduled as one thread per call, but this isn't a requirement. And switching between threads is usually a bit quicker than switching between processes. Okay, so swapping threads in and out on the same call is usually a bit more efficient than swapping processes out on the call. So that's my sort of five minute introduction to OS processes and threads. Um, there's a lot of information out on the internet if you want to delve into that in a bit more detail. Um, but all I wanted to do here was just to give you um, enough of the concepts to be able to understand the discussion I'm going to have about uh, the current parallel programming models. Uh, so, let me see. So, the first pass program model I want to look at is a message passage programming. And this is probably, well, it's always a toss up about which one people understand more naturally as parallel programming, whether it's this or shared memory, or whether people think this is the one that they know best or more naturally come to or shared memory. So, it depends where your background is. But for me, this is um, what I understood as power programming when I first started in this work, longer ago than I care to mention. Um, so message, pass pro message passing programming is process-based. Right? You have multiple processes running simultaneously, and they communicate by exchanging messages. And the reason they have to communicate by exchanging messages is what we talked about a few minutes ago, is that each process has its own separate memory space. Okay, but so Mess so process two can't directly access generally the, the memory space of process one. And so they have to physically send a message which is essentially copying data from the memory of one process to another via some, um, via some process. These can be either be two-sided messages, either in both the sender and receiver involved in a process. So this is like I try to send you a message and then you have to physically grab it at the other end. So with both of us involved there. Or it can be one-sided, where only one's involved. So that's the equivalent of I send a message and put it, and it just gets routed straight into your memory um, without me knowing that it was that knowing that it was coming in. So it can be used for both data and task parallelism. I should maybe explain what I mean by that. There, data parallelism is where I say have um, a long array, and each pro each parallel process operates on a different part of the array. Okay. That's data parallelism, so I'm acting in parallel on a particular data structure. Task parallelism is usually where each parallel process is doing a slightly different task. Okay. So say um, one example in HPC is the Gromax code, which does uh, molecular dynamic simulations of um, biomolecules. It has two types of tasks in its parallel model. It has um, some tasks are evaluating the electrostatic forces through a method called the able sum, and some processes are doing the pairwise sum of forces. And these are two different tasks, and each process is assigned one of these tasks generally. So, in fact, most message passing programs that you find employ a mixture of both data and task parallelism in some ways. They're mixed up in two. And this is often because you want to make different decisions and do different tasks depending on what data your process actually um, is working on. Um, so here's a, a little picture of what I just talked about. So as I said, each process doesn't have access to the person. I mean, the communication is usually explicit. And by that, I mean it's up to the programmer to physically say when the communication takes place. Okay? And I'll talk in a moment a bit about the most common implementation of this and how it happens. But generally, it's through a call to some sort of function or subroutine. Um, you state, I want to send message to process X, or I want to send a message from here to all processes in some sort of collective communication. So in this picture, we have four uh, perfectly synchronized processes, um, each labeled with a different subscript. And as they proceed, the uh, red bars are indicating messages passing 
um, between the processes. It's a slightly false picture because generally processes aren't perfectly synchronized in this way. You would hope that there would be as much as possible, but it's always the case that one might run slightly slower or slightly faster than the other. Um, so um, this is a somewhat idealized picture, and often you'll have many more than this. This is just four, but you, I mean, message passing programs have run up to um, 100,000 processes and beyond even um, now. The advantages of this sort of model is that it's very, very flexible. Okay, so any, almost any parallel algorithm that you can imagine can be implemented in this way. Because you have explicit control of how the parallelism works, um, you can implement whatever you like. Whether that implementation will be efficient or not depends on a number of things. It depends on your algorithm and how that uh, works. How that works, um, and it depends on how well, how good you are at programming it. So you have complete control here, almost. The scaling is usually only limited by your choice of algorithm. That's certainly true, though there are limits to scaling of the uh, most common message passing implementation, which is MPI, because of the way it's implemented. But as I mentioned earlier, that scaling limit is not something that most people hit because it tends to be on the order of hundreds of thousands of processes rather than the hundreds of thousands that people typically use. And the disadvantages in some way is the power routines often become part of the program due to the explicit nature of the communications. So this can hinder readability and um, maintainability of the code in some senses. Once you get used to using something like MPI, you just read them um, quite naturally, but it changes the nature of the program. So for example, particularly in Fortran, Fortran was written very much to be some sort of almost translation of mathematics, mathematical notation. So you'd write your algorithm as if, almost as if you'd write it down um, in mathematical notation on paper. And the parallel nature um, or the way you include message passing explicitly tends to break up that readability. Um, and it can also be a very large task to retrofit it into existing code um, because the algorithm choice might be very different and things like this. Um, it might not give optimal performance on shared memory machines. So if you are particularly using shared memory machines, then there are some advantages, uh, performance advantages usually to using um, shared memory programming approaches rather than using a message passage because there's extra overhead associated with it generally. Um, and it can be very difficult to scale to large and processes due to overheads, as I've said already. So there are, um, always, there's always development work going on to try and um, overcome these problems. So the most common implementation of message passing pro power program that you'll meet by far is something called MPI. So long, long ago, there was a huge zoo of message passing um, libraries. And at some point, I think it was 20 years ago? 20 years ago today, yeah. almost. So almost 20 years ago today, it was standardized into something called um, MPI, the message passing interface. And this library is extremely portable. If there's an HPC machine out there, it will have MPI on it almost without exception, okay? Um, as I said before, it's based on number of processes running really independently in parallel. And the HPC resource you use provides a command to launch on multiple processes. So often, it's MPI exec. Um, so this manages the start of processes across um, the multiple nodes or wherever you're running on. Um, on Archer, it's something slightly different. It's called AP run, which is the Cray implementation of this. Uh, there are a number of different, different implementations, but all, almost all of them support the MPI2 standard. And almost all programs use a small subset of the functionality of MPI. Um, and as we've compiled the variations, we've seen implementations, but the features specified in the standards should work. So things you get these things called like MPitch, um, Open MPI, these sorts of implementations. And on Archer, um, the MPI library is derivative of MPitch. Um, and MPI is actually a very well-constructed library. If you ever go on to use um, newer or different program models, you start to appreciate how well-written MPI is in so many senses. It just takes care of a lot of um, a lot of the things. That you, it takes a lot of the worry out of parallel programming in some ways. You just program generally with MPI, and it generally just works. Okay. There are a lot of things that you worry about in the newer programming models that you don't have to worry about in MPI, particularly things like synchronization. So that's a quick overview of message passing. The other model that's in use um, out there commonly is shared memory programming. And this is, as in contrast to message passing, which is based on processes, this is usually based on threads. Um, 
although some hardware allows processors to be programmed as if they share memory. So you get uh, these uh, NumaLink machines, uh, particularly SGI, have a few offerings in this area. It's sometimes known as symmetric multiprocessing, SMP is a term you'll see out there, although this term is now a little old-fashioned, you don't see it as often as you used to. It's most often used for data parallelism, um, so each thread will operate at the same set of instructions on a separate portion of the data. And this is partially because the origin of the um, most common, or the way the most common um, shared memory programming interface called OpenMP is set up is it was came from very much data parallelism, a very data parallelism background, or at least that was the very, all the examples were generally done that way. It's more difficult to use for task parallelism, but recently introduced things in the standard have made it easier. Um, but generally, if you see OpenMP being used, 95% of the time it will be for some sort of data parallel operation. So here's a picture of a data parallel operation. operation. The threads don't explicitly communicate in the same way as we saw with that message passing program, but they have access to the same memory space, so they can communicate in some sense. So any thread can alter any bit of data. So you can communicate just by writing to memory, and then another thread can pick up that. Um, that new that change. So here we have two threads. Uh, we have a process, and then two threads are formed. They're going to operate on um, two halves of some uh, array of data simultaneously. So you can imagine doing something like a dot product in this way, very simply and easily. And generally, that's what it's used for. So you'll often see that uh, shared memory is used to um, parallelize loop structures. In code. So if you have a very large loop that go, does the same thing over and over again, especially if they're independent tasks in some sense, then shared memory is shared memory programming tends to be very well suited to this. So the advantages are it's conceptually very simple, right? So it's actually very easy to picture what's going on. But some of the message passing program, some of the message passing algorithms can be a bit more difficult. Usually you have very minor modifications to existing code. Um, I'm going to talk about OpenMP in a minute, but generally, you don't actually have to include uh, parallel calls directly in your code. You just add a uh, markup at the start and the end of uh, loops to tell it to parallelize this loop, and the compiler does it automatically for you. And it's very portable. Open, the OpenMP um, API is now available, as well as in vendor, pro, vendor compilers, it's available in GCC. Right? So, and GCC is available everywhere for free. On, all Linux systems, certainly, um, and it comes with OpenMP by default. It can be difficult to implement task-based parallelism, so there's a slight lack. There's, it's not quite as flexible, although maybe some OpenMP experts would claim differently, but it's much harder to have the flexibility that you have with MPI um, using shared memory parallelism. And often, it doesn't scale particularly well to large numbers of processors. You tend to do quite well up to, say, four uh, threads or something like that, but getting really good um, performance after that is quite difficult. And that's generally not due, due to um, the model in itself of shared memory programming, but it's just that um, a lot of programs lack um, that level of parallelism at that level to be able to exploit it properly. So that's the, what I'm saying here. This next point, there's a large amount. You've got to have a large amount of data powers, and you've got to have large arrays and things like that in your code to be able to make this work. And it can be surprisingly difficult to get good performance as OB. It seems very simple just to put some markup around all the loops in your code um, and try and get some performance improvements, but it's actually pre generally proved much more difficult to that. And there's a lot, quite a, a surprising amount of subtlety in shared memory programming that maybe people aren't aware of when you see um, the very simple examples. Um, the standard implementation you'll need to shared memory programming across um, different in, across different machines, there's OpenMP. Um, it's really an API for shared memory programming, and it's usually built into the compiler. So it's not MPI is actually a library that you have to link against when you're compiling. So you tend to call subroutines and functions when using it in OpenMP. As I've said, you mark up portions of your code using pragmas, and um, the compiler interprets them and automatically produces the code um, to do the shared memory programming. The parallelism is much like ex less explicit than MPI in this way. It's a sort of a much more implicit parallelism. What this does do, of course, is mean that um, your code, the structure of your code doesn't change very much, and you don't lose that readability aspect that you can do when using something like MPI, because 
and you can easily maintain a unified code base for the serial and parallel code. So, because all that happens when you're compiling for serial is that the uh, pragmas, the markup gets ignored rather than interpreted by the compiler. So, one thing you're seeing a lot, you're seeing a bit more of um, recently, and a lot of development within over the last, say, five years or so, is hybrid MPI. OpenMP. And the reason for this is most HPC resources, I've said all here, but that's not strictly true, but most HPC resources consist of shared memory nodes connected together with some sort of interconnect. Okay? So in this model, there is a logical separation into shared memory and distributed memory across the machine. And you can imagine that a combination of MPI between the nodes and OpenMP on the nodes maps more closely to this hardware layout and lets you expose different levels of parallelism in your code and exploit them more efficiently. What I'd say, though, is that this hybrid approach doesn't usually lead to a raw speed up of your code. So often, what people are looking for, people imagine you'll get with um, parallel programming, is that your code will get faster and faster and faster as you have more parallelism. And that's actually quite difficult. And say you had a generally people approach this hybrid MPI open MP, <coughs> excuse me, from um, an existing MPI code. And think, oh, I'll just add some OpenMP around the loop so my code will go faster. It'll scale out better. And that's generally not true. You don't usually get more speed up from adding OpenMP into an existing MPI code. What it does do is allows the code to use memory more efficiently. So, <coughs> excuse me, as the number of cores increases and therefore the amount of memory per core decreases, you can generally try to keep up with that uh, trend in the hardware by using OpenMP. Um, and usually allows you to, and this leads you to like, explain more cores for your problem, usually by including, improving the scaling curve at higher core counts. So what this tends to mean is that you can introduce more uh, complexity in your, into your code, um, do more physics in some sense at uh, per um, node, per node, per collection of shared memory cores. So it gives you more flexibility in that sense. But the com complexity of this implementation really depends on the code, your, your actual code. So for some codes, it's very simple codes, it can be quite difficult. For a complex code that has multiple routes through it, it can be very, very difficult to introduce uh, shared memory powers into an existing MPI code and still um, keep performance and actually gain anything for all the effort of um, doing this work. So, um, I've gone on a bit longer than I should have probably, but in summary, um, MPI and OpenMP dominate parallel programming in HPC codes at the moment. I'm talking 95 or more percent probably. Uh, MPI is for message passing programming, distributed memory, separate processes in our definition. And OpenMP is for shared memory programming and separate using threads. Yeah. MPI is generally more general purpose and requires explicit specification of the parallelism. But the scaling you get is usually dependent on your algorithm choice rather than anything inherent in MPI itself. Uh, OpenMP is simpler to implement, but the performance is limited generally by the size of the shared memory part of the hardware. And experience has shown us really that scaling to high core counts is uh, generally very difficult to get for, um, a lot, in a lot of cases. So um, I hope I've given you a useful overview of uh, power, different power programming models. Um, and it just remains for me to uh, answer any questions you've got. I should say that your questions could be about Archer in general as well. I mean, part of the point of these virtual tutorial sessions is um, to give people a, a way to communicate general questions on Archer as well as questions on the topic. But we found it useful to have a topic to provide a focus and so that people can get some um, value out of these rather than just people sitting here and asking them questions. So uh, thank you for listening, and um, I'm feel free to ask any questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. Hopefully there'll be some other people in the chat room to help me too if I don't know the answer. So I don't see anything yet. I mean, one thing I can expand on 
um, if people are interested, is I have some more slides on parallel scaling and how you measure scaling and what the limits of scaling are. So people would rather, oh, sorry. So there's a question from Carol um, asking, um, what do you think HPC will look like in five years' time or even 10 years' time? Well, my, I guess my default response to that is I don't really want to answer that because making predictions on that sort of time scale for HPC generally mean that um, you end up like it looking stupid in five years' time when your prediction is completely wrong. But um, the growth you see, the, the area, the way that things are going is for more and more cores and um, less memory per core. Okay? So I guess the big development of, in interest at the moment is around the um, Intel many core processors. So these are the what, we, what are now known as the Xeon Phi uh, processors, which is generally accelerator cards in some sense at the moment. But uh, the next stage is for development of these. Th the next iteration of these is called Knight's Landing, which is going to have, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly how many cores. But you're talking on the order of 60 to 100 cores um, per processor. Okay? So you need to be able to exploit um, this huge level of parallelism um, within your codes. So generally what it's going to look like is not that much more memory per node at the moment, more processing power per node, um, and the interconnect will look much the same. So the challenge for that in terms of software is exposing all that parallelism, maybe in your algorithm, at the different at different levels. So more calls, essentially. So would people be interested if I, well, I've got a few more slides on um, scaling and power scaling and how you measure it and what the limits are. Um, would there, is there anybody in the room who would be interested in that or would really rather I just stopped here and if nobody's got any questions, we finish up. Fine. Okay. So I'll show you a few more slides. But please feel free, even if you have a question that's not on the slides, um, and you think of something to ask, just interrupt, and I will uh, definitely do my best to answer that. So give me a second, and I will uh, try and bring the new slide, further slides up. Okay. So what have we got? Okay. So one of the things I mentioned a few times. One of the things I mentioned a few times is scaling and measuring scaling. Um, so scaling is actually the performance of a power application, right? And it's how, how does performance change as you increase the number of power processes of threads? And there are really used, people are used to two different types of scaling. And um, strong scaling, where your total props, problem size stays the same as the number of power elements increases. What this means is that um, the amount of work each power process, each separate process or thread has to do, um, gets smaller to increase the number of processes. Or weak scaling, whereas the problem size increases at the same rate as the number of power elements. So the amount of work stays the same for um, each other process or thread power element. Strong scaling is generally more useful, right, because most people have um, a set problem size and just want it to go faster, want to be able to. Um, get the results quicker, uh, but it's more difficult to achieve than weak scaling because as you increase the uh, number, as you'll see in a minute, as you increase the number of processes, you decrease the amount of work per um, core and the serial elements be, tend to start to dominate in your code because every code has some serial elements, be it um, reading or writing from disk or even um, a barrier across all the power communicators that everybody needs to exchange information at some point. Right? See if these parts serialize your code in some sense. Um, so these put limits on um, the actual performance you can get. So how much you can gain from introducing parallels into your code. 
So there are two classic theoretical descriptions of limits of power performance improvement. One is Amdahl's law, which corresponds to strong scaling. How much improvement is possible for a fixed problem size given more cores? Okay? And the equivalent for weak scaling is what's called Gustafsson's law. How much improvement is possible given a fixed amount of time and given more cores? So Amdahl's law and our equation here, it, it's strong. What his law essentially says is the, power, the amount of improvement you can get is strongly limited by the serial problem portion of the code. Adding more processes and threads just increases the importance or increases the impact of the serial portion of your code, which is sort of counterintuitive when you first uh, think about it. So for example, if I have a code that's 90% parallelizable, so in this case P um, is 0.9, P is the fraction of the code that is parallelizable in this uh, code, then for um, 16 having 16 parallel elements of whether it be threads or processes, I can have a maximum of 6.4 times speed off. Right? Ideally, you'd hope that if you have 16 parallel elements, you'd go 16 times faster. Okay? But even with 90% parallel code, which sounds like quite a lot, you could, the maximum speed up you can get is 6.4. And this gets even worse. As you, so if I add 1,024 parallel elements, um, then the maximum speed up I end up with is 9.9, .9, when you'd hope it'd be about 1,000. Okay? So what this tells you is the serial part is really, how much of your code is parallelizable is really important. What this is actually telling you is choosing your algorithm correctly for the problem is really, really important. You have to choose an algorithm that is very, very parallelizable. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to scale to large core counts the serial portions of your algorithm will just kill your performance. So I have a plot here with very small numbers on it. I should increase the size of the numbers on this. The three curves here are um, show how uh, Amdahl's law varies for the number of parallel tasks, the different amounts of parallelized, uh, different amounts of different proportions of the code being parallelizable. So the blue curve is when you've got 95% of your code parallelizable. The red curve is when you've got 90%. And the green curve is when you're about half your code's parallelized, right? And you can see how quickly the uh, speed up tails up off as you go from um, a single core to 1,024 cores in this example. So the maximum speed up you can get from 95% of your code being parallel at 1,024 cores is less than 20 times. Okay? So this looks really disheartening and disappointing. But what it also shows is what a huge amount so quite often you see, we think of codes as scaling well up to 3,000 cores. A huge amount of that code must be parallelized. But it shows you how much work has been gone into making sure that as much of that code is parallelizable as possible. OK. So um, but for Gustafsson's law, sort of the opposite is true. You can. If you can increase the amount of work or keep the amount of work um, static by each process task as you increase the number of processes, then the serial component won't dominate. Okay, so you increase your problem size to maintain scaling. This is the weak scaling approach. So for, for the same numbers as for we saw before with Amdahl's law, if it, your code is 90% parallelizable and you have 16 tasks, you can get 14 to over 14 times speed up. With 1,000 tasks, you can get over 900 times speed up. So this shows you that it's much easier to obtain good scaling for weak scaling when you increase the problem size. So a common example of something like this would be um, if I'm doing a climate simulation and I have a certain grid covering the globe, then if I decrease the size of that grid, then the amount of work for each of these grid points probably stays static, but I have many more of those grid points to treat. Okay? So suddenly my problem, just by decreasing the size of my grid, the problem becomes more parallel. Okay. And you can see this here for the corresponding case for Gustafsson's law compared to Amdahl's law. As you increase the number of cores, your scaling, um, your speed up um, matches um, the core increase in an almost linear manner. The reason this is curved is because the uh, scale on the bottom really is a sort of, some sort of log scale rather than a linear scale.
Okay, these are these missiles, CAD rather than linear. Okay, so sorry, that's um, that's the end of the slide that I had on scaling. But what it actually shows you is that um, strong scaling is really difficult. Good strong scaling is really difficult to achieve, and you have to put a lot of work in to get it. Um, and people always talk about how poorly scaling most codes are. Certainly at this sort of level of uh, petaflop machines, which is what Archer is now. Archer is about 1.6 petaflops. And there's not many codes on the system that it can exploit the full system. And this shows you why that is the case, because it's very, very difficult um, for most people, because they have a fixed problem size, to be able to exploit these very large resources. Does anybody have any questions on that or on anything related to Archer or HPC in general? So Ahmed asked from my experience, how does Archer compare to Hector? So there's a number of different components. Depend so the, the guess out answer is in terms of scalability, okay. So in terms of scalability, um, you find that the scaling is better generally and more uniform. Okay, so what has changed between um, Hector and Archer is the nature of um, the interconnect and the interconnect topology. So our Hector had what was called uh, Hector had a 3D torus. Okay, so all the um, nodes were connected together in some sort of three-dimensional grid. Whereas Archer is much more of an all-to-all -all type collection. So between any two nodes, the maximum number of hops is something like five steps. Whereas on Hector, the maximum number of hops to get from one node to another was much longer. It depended on the longest dimension of the torus. So this has helped the scalability in that there's less hops from one node to another. But the actual real thing that's had the scalability is the way in which the um, interconnect chips and the chips have their own internet. The interconnect has its own processes on Archer in some sense, and these so-called um, Aries uh, network interface chips. They're able to dynamically load balance the communication across the whole machine, across the whole interconnect for the whole machine. Okay, and this dynamic nature and the ability to balance and um, find out what the quickest route to get a message is, even though um, the fastest links might be fully occupied, you can take another route, has helped the scalability in June. And certainly in terms of to improve the performance of the scalability generally, although it's still mostly limited by the algorithms and the codes. But what it has also done is it's made the um, scalability much more consistent and depend much less on how your individual application is placed on the machine in terms of which nodes you get. Right? In terms of Hector, you could be very unlucky and get nodes that were as far apart as is possible to be across the internet. On Archer, that doesn't really matter so much anymore. Does that answer your question? Or is there something else you're aiming at? But actually, the key, the key, key thing to scalability is not really the hardware. The key thing to scalability is the algorithms you use in your code. The hardware can help you um, scale out to large numbers of processes if your algorithm is able to. But if your algorithm doesn't scale, then you're just toast. Um, so, I think Ahmed's also asked, do you have any experience with other HPC vendors? And the answer is yes. We're here up at um, EPCC, we also host uh, an IBM Blue Gene Q for um, the particle physics researchers. Um, and in terms of scalability, it has slightly different properties. It, compared to um, Hector, the Blue Gene Q is much more scalable. Right, because instead of a 3D torus, it was a 5D torus. And that had the same properties in some ways as Archer's interconnect does, that there are more routes between nodes, so you have less hops. Um, 
So you tend to find it scaled better than, than, he, than Hector. In terms of Archer, it, the blue gene architecture has slightly different as the properties of the interconnect are different. So the uh, bandwidth is slightly higher between nodes um, and latencies can be different. So taking advantage of different hardware can be uh, difficult, especially when the hardware is quite specialized. But um, generally, it's all, I mean, it's all down to the algorithm. I mean, if you've got an algorithm that fits, it'll gen on a massively parallel machine and it'll fit. You can make it work on all of them. Whereas if you don't have an algorithm that works, then you can't, you're not going to win anywhere. Okay. Um, so, and Paul has asked, can you give an example of algorithms that scale well or badly? Okay, so the answer is probably Yes, so some algorithms scale trivially well, right? So something like a Monte Carlo type algorithm is essentially um, task farming, right? They're multiple independent tasks. So that's an example of an algorithm that scales perfectly in some senses, although, and is quite widely used, right? An algorithm that scales or is difficult to scale well is. Um, for example, a three-dimensional Fourier transform. So where you want to transform from real to Fourier space to frequency space in three dimensions. Because at some level, that algorithm depends on um, all processors having access to all the data in some senses. So at some point, every process has to talk to every other process. Okay. So once your um, three-dimensional Fourier transform is generally of a certain size, then that gives you a limit of the amount of powers and that's available within that algorithm, a hard limit that you can't go beyond. And so it's quite difficult to scale um, that algorithm in parallel across huge numbers of cores. If you can increase the size of your Fourier transform, you get more and more powers and available so it can scale well. So I guess it's not an example of an algorithm that scales but absolutely, it's an example of an algorithm that often has a hard limit um, to scaling. Any algorithm that depends on um, all-to-all type communications and collective communications where everybody has to be involved, you'll find you'll struggle to scale um, particularly well. So the more independence, the more powers and independent powers you have, the better the scaling your algorithm is going to be. So that's quite hand wavy, I realise. It's not very precise. But does that give you an idea of what I mean? And does anybody else have any other questions? <laughs> okay, between finite elements and finite volume methods, I'm afraid that is not my area of expertise. I mean, if you want to, we can find people who know about that. Sorry. If, if there's anybody else on the chat room from the CSE team who does know that, I'm a humble uh, computational chemist at heart, so I don't know that part, that bit of science as well as some other people do. Uh, we, we could certainly find people could answer uh, questions for that, uh, questions on that for you. But you'd have to, I guess, in the first instance, probably I would suggest contact the Archer help desk and we'll route it to the right person who'd be able to answer your question. Because I could waffle for a while, but I wouldn't provide anything proper understanding for you, I don't think. So I better to keep quiet. Has anybody else got anything? Or should I call this I'm sorry, just call this session to an end. What I should say is that if you have any questions, if you think of anything that you'd like to ask um, after this session's finished, please do get in touch with the Archer Help Desk. Okay, although it's primarily for our users, we will do our best to answer questions from other people as well, or at least point you in the right direction um, to get the answers you require. So if you have a question on this sort of stuff and about HPC in general, please do contact the help desk and we'll do our best to help you out. Okay, so I can't see anyone else asking anything or anything like that. So in that case, I'll just say thank you to everyone for coming along and listening. Um, hopefully, the, um, the, well, certainly the slides will go up on the website from this talk in soon, and we'll hopefully put a recording up as well.
um, and advertise it around for people to listen to if they missed the talk. So if you think it's interesting for any of your colleagues or any of your colleagues are interested, the recording should be up there for people to listen to shortly. Okay. Thank you, everyone.